Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. Understanding Sin and Its Causes is the fourth assistance group in the Education and Love series. In this presentation, titled Attitudes to Sin Q&A, Jesus answers written questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Attitudes to Sin. Recorded on the 24th of February 2019 from 11.30am in Nooseville, Queensland, Australia. So the topic of this, of this uh, presentation is Attitudes to Sin Q&A. So I'm going to focus on this particular Q&A, just questions associated with the Attitudes to Sin information that we presented. If we can start with you, Monique, if you could come down to the hot seat. You just move back to the hot seat there, thanks. Okay, you asked a question, and a number of you have asked this same question. What do you mean by God is interested in one lost sheep? Hmm. I feel for many of you, you still have a strange way of seeing God. One of the things that was most difficult for me in the first century was trying to help people who had a very distorted viewpoint of what a parent was to actually talk to them how God is a loving parent. When we use the word parent, so let's just write that word, for many of us that word is a bit of a dirty word, isn't it, sometimes? Or we use the word mother or father, many of us have feelings associated with your mum and dad where, that are unresolved. So you might feel that your dad never took much interest in you, you know, he was too busy working all the time or whatever, or that your mother was quite often bossy and overbearing and sometimes she did one thing and sometimes she did other. She was a bit sort of mixed up with you know, her direction and quite often she was inconsistent with you. And so whenever I use the word God is our parent or God is like our mother or father, a good mother or father, most of us have no idea what a good mother or father really is or what a good parent is, do we? And so we don't really understand God's feelings for us because we sort of associate those words with what our parents' feelings for us are. Now, sure, there's some people that where the parents have a nice feeling for their children, but frequently it's mixed with also other addictions too, isn't it? Like fears that they have about their children and so forth, which God, of course, doesn't have. And so Whenever we think of God, we often think of God in a distorted way because of our background, of our upbringing. So that comes down to the question, what do we mean by God is interested in one lost sheep? Well, from God's perspective, when you sin, when you have a sin in you, you are now out of harmony with God's love and principles. Does it make sense? So here we've got God's principles, which are all loving, kind, considerate. They're all working to your benefit and to your aid. You see, when you think about most parents, that's not necessarily what they did, was it? They didn't work to your benefit or your aid because quite frequently they give you things that you should not have gotten. So in other words, you know, they let you be selfish and get away with it, things like that, things that you shouldn't have got, they gave you. And then frequently, they didn't give you things that you should have gotten. <laughs> and for some in modern families, it seems that discipline is one of those things. When I say discipline, I'm not talking about smacking the child. I'm talking about actual correction of the child's behaviour. You know, frequently, parents don't do that. They just let the child run pretty unruly nowadays. Or they give the child a whole heap of things that, you know, things like, physical things, but there's not much feeling of love or compassion. I was down on the bounce this morning having a bounce and, uh, and this young fellow brought his child, his little two-year-old, he looked to be just a bit under maybe, and dad was just there, like his child was just playing in the sand and bouncing on the bouncing thing, and mat, and, but dad was really just flicking through his mobile phone. So what, was there any connection there? And then occasionally dad would look over, oh, yeah. <laughs> and back to his mobile phone, you know? Now, 
you know, he probably thinks he's a pretty good dad being out there with his son or and it was his son. But the reality is there's not much connection there. What's the child feeling under those circumstances? The child's pretty much alone, isn't it? So when we talk about parents, many of us feel alone even. Many of us feel that our own parents don't understand us, do we not? Right? In fact, that's a very common thing because most of our parents don't understand us because they, you know, they've been usually quite insular with their own lives and involved in their own lives, not really understanding us as their children. So when we see all of that, we go, well, you would compare that with God. We're now sort of attributing God as having all of those kind of feelings, which is not true. So what we mean by one lost sheep is in, in Bible times, a sheep was considered to be something that was you know, easily harmed you know, by the environment, but a precious commodity. And so back then, we used to use sometimes illustrations relating to sheep Whereas goats were a bit more like in your face out there, aren't they? Like, <laughs> and you know that, don't you? Because, you, you know, I don't know if you've ever compared a sheep farm with a goat farm. But I tell you what, the goats seem to get in a lot more strife than the sheep. Because goats have also a natural personality that's more connected to human condition than sheep do, which is interesting in itself. And um, most uh, animals develop in such a way where they have... Goats have had a long-standing history with humanity and as a result they're quite connected to humanity and our responses. You know, I'm talking about domesticated animals here. And oftentimes you see them reflecting the human condition quite frequently. So we used to use the term sheep for somebody who, you know, could be led but also could be harmed, right? Which is often what we are, aren't we? We could be led and, but we also could be harmed. And so when God's interested in the lost sheep, the lost sheep is the sheep that has been led astray, that has gone away from what you could say God's principles or laws. Now, from God's perspective, every child is precious. You individually are precious to God. We still have this sort of viewpoint for most of us that God is this sort of far-off nebulous concept or idea and that God's laws, because God's laws are so fixed and immovable and they all apply to everyone, that that means that God isn't really interested in me personally. He's just interested in all people. All right? And nothing could be further from the truth. For those of you who have had, parents, had children, if you really love your children, each of your children, you're interested in them personally, aren't you? You're interested in their personal life. And what one does and what the other does can be completely different things, can't they? And you're still interested in their life, aren't you? You're still personally interested in what they do and what they feel and how they think and how you know each child is different because everyone has a different personality that God created. So you, you get to know each one on their own merits. Well, that's what God's like with you. And he's interested in what you do. He's interested in how much unhappiness you cause for your life. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to experience his love, just like a parent would want all of their children to experience the love that the parent has for them. So when we talk about God being interested in one lost sheep, we're talking about you personally being important to God as an individual, not as a collective, but individually, by yourself, important. To God. Now, it's very hard to get that concept across when we're talking about God for most people until they truly experience God's love personally. Because once you personally experience God's love, you then start seeing how personal it is with you and God. How personal it is for God that you have a relationship with God, you, not any necessarily everybody else. God would like a relationship with everyone. But it is a personal relationship, just like a parent would have a personal and quite frequently different kind of relationship with each of their children. right? And so we need to see that God is interested in us to this personal degree. If we see that, that is going to help us hear God. right? But for most of us, we don't see God like that. We still see God as some like energy source. 
you know, plug in the power, get, get a hit, off we go type of thing. We don't see God as having a personality or nature. Right? And this is something that needs to change if we're going to have this personal relationship with God. The beauty of a personal relationship is you start realising, we, we did a really lovely channelling and I don't think it's been put up yet because I'm a bit behind with editing at the moment. I think I'm 12 sessions of editing behind in our video editing at the moment. So, but we did one, you remember we started a series of uh, mediumship with Stuart. He talks about once he got to the fifth sphere and developed more in his relationship with God, and he started talking about how it felt that God knew him and often that God knew him better than he knew himself and how amazingly beautiful it was to be known, actually known by somebody. Because reality is for most of us living on earth and also for most of us as we were growing up, as I said, even our parents don't know us and we barely know anybody. In fact, frequently we barely know even our partner that we lived with for 20 years or 30 years or so because they only expose to us what they want us to know generally. But God knows everything. And while that might sound scary, it's also really great because it means there's no, there's no need for subterfuge for, for any you know, denial of anything that's within you because it's all God already knows it's there anyway. And when God can start reflecting back to you knowledge about you, then you realise how much God knows you. Right? Now this has a great bearing on your attitude to sin because a lot of us get real impersonal about this God thing, right? We do. And in the process of getting so impersonal, we then start thinking, oh, it's all just law, 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 this law, that, yeah. You know, instead of seeing that each law, God had a loving intention for its creation. So each sin we commit automatically is against the loving intention. So what that means is we're harming ourselves. And the beauty of having a relationship with God is God can tell us when we're harming ourselves or when even when we're about to harm ourselves. Right? So many of you have asked questions about what about experimenting? Isn't there a possibility that I'll sin if I experiment? And then I'll get myself into more trouble. There's no trouble if you have the relationship with God because you can talk to God, I'm thinking about doing this, what do you think about it? And he can say, well, it's got this problem and that problem with it and it's got this good thing and that good thing. Choose, you know, choose the good out of it and get rid of the bad parts out of it and you'll be right. But he can tell you that up front before you go ahead and do the thing. Right? Just like you could go to a good, loving parent and say, look, I'm thinking about buying a house, what do you think about it? And they go, well, it's got this problem and that problem, but you can do this and you can do that. They help you with solutions. It's exactly the same. right? So we need to start seeing God as being able to have a personal interest and a personal communication with us, even without us receiving God's love, because that's the mechanism of the conscience. So our suggestion again to you here is go back to that stuff that we did in 2017 and 2018 about the conscience in the God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance series of, talks, of discussions we did in the studio and really contemplate how you can experiment with the conscience because that will help you start developing this personal chit-chat with God where you take things to him just like you would take it to a friend and you talk to him he doesn't want you to do what he says. In fact, what he'll do is he'll tell you what, you know, what is the right and wrongs of things, but you, you can still do what you want. Right? It's not like a parent is going to give you a whole list of things and say, now if you don't do what I just suggested, you're banned, you're no longer, you're disinherited, <laughs> and so forth, right? He's not like that. Right? So that's what we need, how we need to see God. So for yourself, money. I know you're asking a lot of questions about God, which is really, really good. But the key is to experiment with your relationship with God through those two mechanisms, the conscience and receiving some of God's love. When you receive some of God's love, you know God is interested in you personally. But before then, 
you can experiment with that by talking to God and just seeing what kind of responses you get. But to do it, you've got to be in a nice, quiet space, right? Initially, in particular, because you're not usually very sensitive to hearing anything coming back at you, you know? God has a nice, quiet voice. It's not like a parent who yells and screams at you, right? Yeah. So it's a good question. The second question you had, Monique, was why must I examine my attitudes towards sin before I can awaken to sin? Yesterday we said awakening to sin had a series of processes. Do you remember those processes? You want to flick back to your notes and get out those processes of awakening to sin? And I'll just uh, pop them up here. Remember this? This is where we started talking about the process. We said in the process of awakening to sin, there were a number of steps, right? And we've listed those steps there, right? You can see the first step is realizing that I do sin. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a pretty big thing for a lot of people because most people don't think they do. Realizing my will and desire are what creates actions and result in pain. So that's an important part. But why must I examine my attitudes? This line here says, my sinful actions cannot be fully corrected without correcting my will or desire in disharmony with God's love and principles or correcting my lack of will and desire in harmony with God's love and principles. So the first one in disharmony, the second one in harmony. Sin of commission, sin of omission. My sinful actions cannot be fully corrected without correcting my will or desire to engage in sins of commission or sins of omission. So if I don't examine my attitudes, how am I going to know what my will or desire is? I really can't know it, can I? Unless I can examine my attitudes and see what my will or desire is. Now remember your will is your current state. In other words, what is it you're desperate for right now? So you need to know that, don't you? Well, that's your, that's your attitudes. And then also, what am I desperate for in my future? You know? Like I noticed a few of you have asked questions like, I, I'm really desperate for people recognising that I'm, you know, being ahead of the pack type of thing. I'm desperate for that. That's a desperation for something in your future, right? And to see that, ah, oh, maybe that's creating a lot of my sin, that would be a good thing to see that's an attitude that you have to sin. So you can't recognise your will or desire unless you start recognising your attitudes and your actions. Does that make sense? Yep. So when it comes to sin, recognising your actions and then recognising what attitudes drive those actions can help you greatly, right? But then you've also got God in your corner and you can talk to God, what are my attitudes? Because he, he's happy to tell you, if you really want to know, you will be able to hear him, right? He's happy to tell you what your attitudes are. And he's also happy if, he, if you can't hear him directly, he's happy to try to help other people who can hear him directly to say to you, this is what your attitude is. He's happy to do both things for you, right? So we must examine attitudes in order to awaken the sin. And we also must, if we really want to do it easily, start connecting to God at least about our sin. Does that make sense? We need to do both things. And if we do both of those things, you'll find discovery of truth about your sins is quite simple. So this is the process I engaged in the first century, and it's also the process I engaged in this life. When I was about 33 and I went through a big upheaval in my personal life, I realized that I had to be far more sensitive to what is the truth about things if I was going to be happier than I was at the time. Because at the time, I felt almost suicidal. So like I, I wanted to sort that out. And so what I started realizing is I had to change from like just relying on what I was taught to do the right thing, taught to do what everybody thought was the good thing. And in my case, 
I was a member of a religious faith that they had a whole heap of rules that I was trying to follow and, and trying to engage. And, and I also had a whole heap of personal concepts of what it meant to be a good dad and what it meant to be a good husband and all these kind of things. And I had to look at my entire life more sincerely with truth. Now, once I started to do that, it was amazing how quickly certain things came to me through the operation of the conscience. I started realizing, ah, the main reason why I'm numbed out to life is because I don't let myself feel my emotions. This is something that God told me right from the beginning, that I had to feel my emotions and I had to give up what everybody else thought of me doing that and I just had to do it. Right? Now, I listened and I did that. And sure, I got criticized. I still do to this day. You know, get criticized for things. This morning, I got accused of being a pedophilia, basically, by email. You know, these are, people accuse me of all sorts of things, but you've just got to forget what people accuse you of and get on with doing the right thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, the woman was removed from one of our. She wanted to come to one of these sessions. We told her she couldn't because of her past behaviour. And then instead of just going, fair enough, now she's reported me to put it to the police. So we'll see where that goes. But she wanted to come to one of the groups. A bit strange. But this is where th people go, right? And you've got to forget about these kind of things and you've just got to move into what is the truth about things. And once you're really dedicated to finding out the truth about things, the truth comes to you quite clearly. So on this matter, I know the truth is she's just upset about getting kicked out of one of my groups because I'm tired of her bad behaviour from the past. That's the truth. There's nothing else I need to worry about, is there? I know I'm not a pedophile and I know, that I, I know what I do when I notice pedophiles, which is quite a lot more than what anybody else does. So, so I know there's nothing to be concerned about, nothing. See, most of us are worried about what everybody thinks about us and so we don't listen to what God's saying to us, right? So when God says, give up what everybody thinks about you, you go, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. My life will turn out bad if I do that, right? No, it won't. It'll turn out better. Trust me, it's really good. You don't have to worry about what anybody thinks anymore. Like, I used to do that. I know what, how bad it is. I used to wait, stay up at, late at night worrying, you know, like about what was going on the next day. I used to do all that, all that planning and everything. I used to do all that, you know. I don't do all that anymore. God, through the conscience, is sharing with me what I need to work on and what I don't need to work on. I, I like that. It's like having a friend telling me, and a friend that you can trust, you know, like, that can correctly assess every situation. Isn't that great? Like you go to a normal friend and they've got their own issues, right? They have. They've got their own history, their own different experiences with their own mother and father. They've got their own issues in their day-to-day -day life. You know, they might have had a string of bad relationships and they might be angry with men or angry with women as a result of that. And, you know, you just tell them a little thing and they're up in arms about those things, you know. But God doesn't do all that. God just says, this is the principles, Here, here's the moral point of truth on the matter. Choose what you want to do. It's great. Free, freeing. If you're willing to go through the feelings, you know, like I had to give up a lot of feelings about what people thought of me to do that. Yeah. So I had a good cry for a few months and got over it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, so just going to tick. Office use here for <laughs> just for Mary's sake. <laughs> Tip office use there for Mary's sake. Okay. So you can see both answers, Monique. To awaken to sin, you've got to see your attitudes. If you can't see your attitudes, you're never going to awaken to your sin. And God can help you see all of your attitudes. God can help you see everything. The sin, everything. So it makes sense to connect to God. Many of us want to see God like we see our parents. 
and we've got to go through the process of giving that up emotionally. Make sense? Yeah? Thank you. Good day. Alex, you're next. I chose this because it's a good example of seeing the wrong sin. <laughs> All right? So you say a woman comes into our cafe and projects heavy neediness at me to tell her what she should have. I can imagine that would be very frustrating. You're sitting there waiting and she's saying, what do you think I should have? <laughs> you know, like do all of her thinking and decision making for her, right? And of course you feel, you know, after a while you get a bit angry with that. And I suppose she's doing this pretty regularly, right? Every week is it or every day? I seem to attract it quite a lot. Right, no worries. So I can see my sin to control, but what am I supposed to do with it? Your sin isn't to control. I'm getting angry, which is, isn't that a desire to stop her? Well, it's a desire to stop her, but, but that's not the sin. That's the action. Remember, we've got to see the difference between, and this is a good illustration of how to see the difference between sin and action. Sin is a desire which is either in harmony with God so that's absent, right? So this one's absent, so no pure desire in other words. Or there's a commission one where the actual desire is in disharmony. with God, which is present. You know, so that's something that's present within us, something that, to do. That's the sin. Then we have, remember, we have the actions. And your action is to, your first action, your first response is angry. The second response is desire to control, right? And even your anger is to try to control in many cases, right? Okay, but they're just, they're just actions. They're, they're not the sin. What's the sin? You don't want women to have you don't want to have to do anything for women. You want women to do things for you. Right? Do you see feel that? You can feel that, sure. Yeah. yeah. I get confused because mum was she was very needy too, so I was Yeah, your mum was needy and it peed you off as a child, right? You you're upset about that. And so now you just want women to do things for you and you don't want to have to do anything for them. And when they're needy and everything, they just remind you of your needy old mother who just demanded that you do a whole heap of things for her, make a whole heap of decisions for her, and you're sick and tired of all that, and you don't want to feel about that. Right? There's your sin. You haven't released that. Right? You've chosen to not release that. Instead, you prefer to blame the woman. So if the woman doesn't give you, help you and give you things, do things for you, you're going to be peed with her no matter what she is and what she does. You follow? So the sinful act, which is the anger and the desire to control and try to manipulate her into just getting it over or done with or kick her out of your shop or whatever you want to do, right? Well, I've got to be nice. Yeah, that, all that, you know, you feel like doing that, but then you realise, oh, there's the money side. I might lose a bit of cash from that. So there's, there's another reason why that doesn't happen, right? But at the end of the day, none of that, they're the actions. That, that's not the sin. The sin is actually the desire inside of you which says, I am so tired of giving to needy women that I just never want to do it again. And I'm very upset and angry about that and I don't want to release that because it was quite painful in my childhood. I don't want to go to that. I'm not going to go to that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to either live with women who give me everything I want or they can pee off out of my life. Do you know what I mean? You've got one or the other. I usually just want to run. But you were pretty angry doing it. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's all traced back to the underlying sin. And it's a false belief, of course. Not all women are like that. But you believe all women are like that. 
It's not really true, though, because half the women are the other half, which give to you whatever you want. <laughs> and you're okay with them, but they're sinning doing that too. So you're okay with them sinning there because they're feeding the vortex of your sin, you see. Your sin, the desire to just get from women without having to give anything. Yeah. Make sense? Thank you. Good day. Tick office, yes. Okay. Phoebe, where are you, Phoebe? Up there, could you come down to our hot seat? Because you asked a good question, which I've sort of mentioned a little bit about. So, Okay. The question Phoebe asks is, is the sin of inaction worse than the potential sin of experimentation with courses of action, which I'm unsure of or I'm unsure of the outcome of or unsure of my own intention of <laughs> doing? This is a question about, is it better to do something than it is to do nothing? Really, isn't it? Yep. What do you reckon it might be? Do something, yeah. Why is doing something better than doing nothing? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, because doing something will bring a result of some kind. right? And remember I said this. The sin is already in you as a desire. right? It's the desire present. It's not the action. So let's say you choose to take an action. What's that action based on? It's based on the desires that are already present in you. Can you see that? So you, you choose to take an action. You think it's a good action. You choose to take it, but then you get some painful results. What's that telling you? Yeah, it was that the desire was not loving. No, it's not telling you that. <laughs> See, you all wanted to say that, but it's not telling you that. What is it telling you? It's not telling you that the desire was wrong because you might have had a desire that was actually pure in that moment and you took an action and you got a painful response. How, how did the painful response come? Could it be that while the desire was good, part, parts of the desire was good, other parts of it were not so good? Could it be that? Most probably is, right? Because this is where most of us go. Most of us have a very black and white thing about our experiments. So what we do is this. We go, right, I'm going to choose to take this specific action, and I take the action, and then I get a negative result. Now, just to give you an example of that, I hear it's really, really good to be truthful at all times. Truth. So I remember that and I go, man, that sounds really appealing. I would really like to learn how to do that. That sounds like it would be quite a lot of freedom in that. That sounds like it might have some advantages, right? So your partner comes along and says to you, uh, what do you feel about me doing this? And in the past you would have just gone, well, you can do what you want, that's fine. Right? But now, because you're being truthful, you say, well, you've asked me what I feel, and this is what I feel. I feel you're a bit of a stupid idiot doing that. Right? Because the reason why is it because of this and that and this and that. They're like, you know, that's what I feel. Right? So before you would have just shut up and just gone, oh, whatever, and now you're saying the truth uh, that you feel. Now, it's your truth. It's not the truth, is it? It's not God's truth. You've just said what you feel. He or she asked you what you feel, so you have to say what you feel. Like when you guys ask me, do you believe in earth change events? I go, yeah. Right? You asked me, and I still believe in them. So I'm going to go, yeah. I might be wrong. I've said that. Right? But you ask me for the truth of how I feel, which is different to the truth of how God feels, isn't it? And if you ask somebody for the truth of how they feel, then you should be prepared to get the answer of the truth about how they feel, right? Which is how they really feel, whether it's angry, upset, you know, bitter, twisted, whatever it is they feel. And if you're honest and truthful now, you're experimenting with this whole truth idea, you know, which is really out there for the world, really, you would say what the truth is. Now, 
Now then they go, well, now you're just being a bitch and like, like you know, that's not very nice. Why, you know, why do you feel all those things for? Now you're just trying to stop me from doing what I wanted to do. You know, and they carry on and carry on at you now. And so now you're getting some painful responses, right, from the person. So what do you decide next time? They come up and ask, you know, how do I look in these? <laughs> right? And what do you do? Well, you've got to tell them a whole heap of crap because this is what you think, right? This is what we do. We think that telling them the truth was the problem. But it's not the problem. The problem is there's a number of things. Firstly, my truth could have been distorted. So I'd have to have a look at that, wouldn't I? The whole principle of telling the truth is still good, isn't it not? So why would I stop telling the truth the next time? It's because I don't understand where the distortions came in. My truth might be distorted. Their response might be distorted. Do you see? There could be lots of things that are going on that cause the response that are nothing to do with the truth. But I'm tempted now to blame telling the truth as the problem. Now, if we get back to your desire, so you desire to do what you believe is a good thing, but you get some negative kickback for it. Does it mean the original idea was a bad idea? Not necessarily. It could mean that there was a part of the original idea where you needed something from people or you needed them to honour your decision and that part of it was bad. But the actual intention was good. You see what I'm saying? Because frequently when we decide to do something, we decide to do something with a whole lot of mixed emotion in it. God's trying to help us sort it all out and sort out which bit of that is wrong or a sin, out of harmony without love, but which bit of it is good? So when I first started uh, teaching, I go, well, you know, this whole thing of me having to say I'm Jesus, that's a bad thing, right? Uh, because to be frank, everybody that's ever heard me say that generally has gone through months, if not years, of doubt about everything I say because I said that thing, right? If I didn't say that thing, we'd have tens of thousands of people listening to Divine Truth by now. But because I say that thing, it's still not very many people, right? Because everyone has that mistrust. So I could have said right at the beginning, I really want to teach this truth. I know I'm Jesus, but I'll just keep that to myself. Right? Couldn't I? Right? Now, if I had have done that, I would have got perhaps a better result than we're getting now seemingly better result that I'm getting now because it meets everybody's addictions to not be confronted by that issue, right? But at the end of the day, it was going to work out pretty bad, wasn't it, down the track? At some point, if someone honestly asked me, who do I think I am, right? then I'd have to say, wouldn't I? Or I'd, what do I say? No comment. <laughs> Which is what the politicians nowadays say, don't they? Or, or someone, you know, who's on the witness bench, you know, no comment, no comment, no comment, you know. Now, what I realised is that God's going to refine, if I take an action that I believe to be right and I can see through my own analysis of God's laws already at this stage that it is a right course of action. It's in harmony with love. It's in harmony with truth. It's a, driven by a desire that is pure and not motivated by any selfishness. It's not motivated by a desire to act receive adulation. In fact, me saying I'm Jesus usually receives a lot of like pretty bad attack. So I'm certainly on that issue pretty clear, <laughs> you know, that me saying that I'm Jesus is not driven by an impure desire because the reality is I'd like to not say that I am still at this stage because I haven't fully worked through the emotion. But God is going to purify my desire. So I get up in front of a bunch of people, let's say, and I've decided I'm never going to say I'm Jesus. And I did do this right at the beginning. So I start talking about divine truth, put it all aboard, you know, all this secrets of the universe stuff generally right at the beginning. And sooner or later, every single presentation, you know what someone would do? 
How do you know all this? <laughs> and what do you say to that? Like, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what most of you probably would have done, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With the examples you've used, so your intention, you know that your intention is pure or good? Not always. No, I didn't know. See, my intention to not say who I was was not pure, was it? Can you see why? Because it's allowing people to believe the lie without saying the lie. Do you see what I'm saying? So I got sorted out very first presentation. God sorted me out. <laughs> the person who put up the hand sorted me out. So you should take action on any desire that you have rather than, because I feel like I've just sat and sat and sat on any, any desire for so long that's caused a lot of pain. To be honest, Phoebe, with you, I've seen you start taking some desires. You know, the website you put up about miscarriage, a lot of really good things you've done there. You, you've taken some desires and you've run with them. And in that process, you're going to get some people, you know, attacking and some, you know, there's all sorts of things that will help purify your desire. I've had to go to the stage where I realise that not everybody does want to hear the truth, even though the truth is such a happy thing. Not everybody wants to hear it, you know. I've had to realise how much uh, spirit influence there is on the planet wanting to distract people from truth, you know. And these are things that you learn by taking action, putting into action your desire, taking the actions, and then letting God tell you things through taking the pure action. So most of us do know what pure actions are, and then we take them, but because we get mixed results, we then believe the original pure action must be faulty. And it's not true. Like, I could have got up there and gone, yes, I'm teaching all this divine truth. I put a person puts his hand and I say, and I could have said, no comment, right? Could have said, no, no, I don't want to talk about that. Right? Now, in time, God would have shown me that that was just wrong. But it, fortunately, I was sensitive enough to the ethics of it right from the beginning to not get into that trap. Does that make sense? But you know, I would have, like, for the first few groups, that's what happened until I openly disclosed up front. And from then on, I never got that question ever again. Ever. The law of attraction now showing me, no, nope, I'm on the right path now. I'm being honest about things. Make sense? So you've got to follow your pure desire. So the, your answer to the question is, is Inaction worse than the potential sin of experimentation. It's not a sin to experiment. The sin already exists in you. So let's say you take an action because you want people to know about miscarriage in your case, right? You take an action. Now, you know it's going to be a bit tricky, don't you, how people will respond to that particular subject given the fact that you're talking about the mother's emotions. So that must be motivated pretty well because otherwise you probably wouldn't even bite it off in the first place, would you? Right? So, so the original motivation must be pretty good. So any sin that's in you, like let's say you're looking for somebody to really adore you for doing it and you find a whole series of people don't adore you initially as a result of what you're doing and that tells you, ah, oh, the issue is not the fact that I'm doing it because that's a good thing. The issue is that I need adoration. And once I give up this need for adoration, you might find you get some adoration actually, you know, or some appreciation for what you do. So, you know, the, these are things you go through and, you, and you've got to realise that the experimentation is not the sin. The sin is usually already in you and God is trying to help get it out of you. When you do something, you will see that it's tainted by the sin that's already in you. Don't stop doing, just purify the action by removing the sin. Do you see? Instead of just stopping altogether and not doing anything, 
because you can stop altogether for years. I've seen people do it for a long time. Yeah, I already feel like I want to with that desire. Like yeah. I can feel that there's some desires in me that are pure, like with that one, because it felt good. Like I felt good. Yeah, but see, in time, you do it first and it feels good, and then you get some negative responses, which is normal. That's now triggering the sins that are in you, which now say, oh, let's give it all up. Let's give up this original good desire. Does it make sense? And that's not what God's trying to do here. He's trying to help you refine or purify your original desire because it's a great thing to do. A great thing to do. Like I said, there's 150 million miscarriages on this planet every year. Surely it would be nice for women to find out why that's happening. Truthfully find out why that's happening. So, you know, there's 150 million mothers who are grieving every year. There's 150 million children arriving in the spirit world without development every year. Now, that's a big problem. Anything you can do to repair it is a great thing, so that's a good motivation. So if it's now not working very well because there's some attack coming from mothers or some people belittling you as a result of it, that's normal. That's what is happening to help you purify your desire to get away from needing the approval of other people before you do something. Does it make sense? Needing the acceptance of people before you think you've done a good thing. You've done a good thing. If you ask God about it, I'm pretty sure he'll tell you, you've done a good thing, girl. Do you know what I mean? Just got to purify these desires about you know, needing everyone to agree or needing everyone to feel good about what you're saying. You've got to get away from that. That's what he's asking you to release now. So it's being identified, release it. It's just confusing because like, you know, I said like I stopped that action, you know, and so it kind of just shut down. But then I feel like, I feel like there's desires in other areas of my life that are opening up too. Like I feel somehow a little bigger or something like, like I want to do other things as well. And I'm just worried. Like I just feel afraid that, the influences are not good, you know, because I've started some good things and then these other unrelated influences are maybe pulling me away. Or well, that's very – that can happen. It can happen where, you know, you start something good and it can turn into something bad because you're not purifying your underlying desires for doing that good thing in the first place. So let the process continue. One thing I see is that most people think of a good thing They take some initial action to do that good thing and when it doesn't work out how they expect, and let's face it, most of us expect everything to just go smooth and easy and nice. When it goes smooth and easy and nice, we say, the universe loves me for doing that thing, which is a bunch of crap really because there's a whole heap of people who are just supporting your addiction doing that thing. But when you're really doing something that's going to change the world, There's very few people initially that's going to agree with you. So we've got to get used to that as, no, I'm going to sit out on this ledge. I don't know if you've ever seen that picture, you know, in the States, how there's that that mount that's got this great big ledge on the end. My brother went there one time and he sat right on the edge like that, 5,000 feet, I think it is, down and, uh, you know, down to the valley. And he's just sitting there on the edge. He took a picture and... uh, and apparently someone recently fell off it. But you imagine like that's how you're living your life, really sitting on the edge. Right? People are going to criticise that. So I'm not suggesting you do that physically on that ledge. But I'm suggesting that you do that with the, the choices and decisions you make in your life, where you sit on the edge, you focus on what is the good thing to do, you go ahead and do it. You're going to love doing it until everyone starts hammering you for it. And then you've got to work through your emotions about how you feel about people not agreeing with you, how you feel about people not approving of you, how you feel about not being adored and loved for what you did, how you feel about doing something which took a lot of effort and nobody really appreciates it. You've got to work through all those things. That's how you purify your desire, you see? Make sense? So, yeah, take the action. Don't sit there and do nothing. Sitting there and doing nothing is a big mistake. Biggest mistake people make, actually, is to sit there and do nothing. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sweetie. Good question. 
Yawn. You want to come into the hot seat? Thank you. Welcome. You've asked, can you believe emotionally that something is wrong and still go ahead and do it? Hmm. Good question. I just wanted to give you a brief answer because it's going to be answered in the last two days of our presentations. There are morals, there are values, and then there is the faith that you have. So I'll just write those things down. Morals, values, and faith. Now, we'll get to them later, right? Morals, values, and faith. But what we need to come to see is that they have a hierarchy. So the reality is, yes, you can believe something emotionally is true in that sense that you feel the morality of it, but it could be that you value, your value of a different thing is higher. So values, morals and faith have hierarchy. So in other words, some values are more important than other values. And some morals are more important than other morals. And some faiths blow everything away. Do you know what I mean? They get rid of all your morals and all your values. Just one belief of what you believe to be true. So yes, you can actually believe something emotionally is wrong. You can, so you can actually feel the morality of something. But because you don't value it and you value something more, as more important, you can ignore it and still act in sin. Make sense? Yep. Any questions about that? It's pretty clear. This is what I was, was feeling actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we'll talk more about that in the last two days of our presentations, but it is something for all of us to bear in mind. Just because you feel there's a certain moral position inside of you on a certain subject, it doesn't mean you're going to live by it because there could be other more dominating factors in your life that are more important to you than that thing that you act upon. So can I ask? Yeah. Is it also when you receive some truth from God and um, you just shut down emotionally to this because that you just reject everything? And Yeah, it's very common where let's say we have a certain uh, value stance on something and then... We start to connect to God just experimenting with the conscience, you know, and we go, we ask God about that thing and we get a very clear, no, that's not a good thing, mate, right, from God. And then you go, well, now I don't really want to hear from God because I still, <laughs> I still want to do that thing, right? So this is where we've got to get really honest with ourselves and be honest with the fact that, yeah, the reality is I just got told the truth, but I really still want to do that thing that I want to do. And, you know, either I've got a now decision to work through that or in a lot of people's cases, what they do is they shut down their relationship with God so they don't hear that anymore. Make sense? And it's not a good choice because every time God says something's not a good idea, he's doing it for, for love's sake. You know, he, he's thinking of your welfare and the welfare of others too. God sort of just steps back and goes, well, yeah, you're going to have to learn from experience on that one now. You know, you're going to have to go through an experience which uh, probably going to be a bit painful now because you're not listening to me. You could have just listened and trusted, right? But what happens for most of us is we have some values or some faiths or some morals that are in disharmony with what God's telling us. And so what do we do with it? We just dismiss what God's told us. But in dismissing what God's telling us, we also have to dismiss our relationship with God. So that, you know, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? You dismiss your relationship with God, now you don't receive all the benefits of the relationship with God. So I found through experience it's much better to stay open to what God's saying and then change your life in harmony with it, no matter how much resistance you have to it emotionally or not. Yeah. Thank you. Good day. In my time, just so I've got a few more. Maybe I can squeeze one or two. Yeah. Patricia, can we go to you next? Thank you. 
I'm just going to focus on your number one question that you had on this subject. Your question was, if I understand correctly, feeling an emotion will cause an out-of-harmony emotion to dissipate. You mean an out-of-harmony with love emotion to dissipate and a harmonious with love emotion to grow. Is this true for sinful desires? I've been hesitant to try it. Good question. Yes, it is true. Uh, let's just uh, rub this off. So let's look at emotion. Now, remember emotions contained within the soul. It's there. If I'm not feeling it, it's still there, isn't it? So that's one thing I need to remember. Just because I'm not feeling it, it doesn't mean it's not there. <laughs> so we've got to be careful, like with sinful desires sometimes, you can sort of say, oh, ooh, that was a sinful... No, just pop that out the side and suppress my feeling of that, in other words. Suppress my feeling of that. Now, the trouble is what we've learned about the soul already, if you look at the human soul and how it was made, we've done some discussion about that, you can see preclusion operates in the soul, which means that if you suppress one emotion, you're suppressing lots of emotions. You can't selectively choose emotions to suppress without actually causing a numbing down of all of your emotions. So this is why most people, when they get to be 40, 50, 60, they're already quite numb on a lot of issues because they're suppressing lots of different things and there's barely anything now that they can feel. So there's a danger in suppressing the emotion, isn't there? So let's say the emotion is a sinful desire, right? which is the question you've asked about. So let's say this emotion is actually a sin. What do I do with it? Now, what I'm saying is you have to feel it. Now, you can feel it without acting upon it, or you can feel it and act upon it, or you can suppress it. You can do any of those things. Which is the best choice? Well, if you feel it without acting upon it, it will flow through you and get released. And then you won't feel it as much anymore. Right? Now, you've been afraid to experiment with that. Why are we afraid to experiment with that? Because, you know, what are we really afraid of? Well, I was afraid that the emotion would grow. Exactly. You're afraid of like, I'm having this sin, this sin is in me, I know this sin's in me, right? It's there. If I pat around it, put some protection layers around it, build up a nice eggshell around it, put some paper mache over the top of it, paint it with pretty colours, it's no longer there. <laughs> is that the truth? Well, this was sexual desire, and so it was oh, like... I, I know what it's about. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? You think that if you cover it all over and just make out that it's all just going to go away? Well, n no, I wanted, to, well, I wanted to make it go away. But I thought that if I kept feeling it, that would just feed it. Yeah, no, will you? If you've got a, a sinful emotion and you recognise it as... And, and is sexual desire a sinful emotion? No, but this was not soulmate desire. How do you know that? Logically. <laughs> so your intellect is telling you. Well, my understanding about soulmates is there's a geographical... I mean, my, obviously, I don't know. Um, but given that... That's the first point of honesty, yes. You don't know. So stop telling yourself you know by logic. You don't know. You can't feel your soulmate, can you? No. No, okay. But you do feel sexual desire for somebody, obviously. Right. Right. I said you can feel your sexual desire without acting upon it. Right. Right. Can't you? Or I can hope you? So. <laughs> you can. Everybody I can. can. Yeah. It's just yeah. whether you want to or not, doesn't yeah, it? I can. See, a lot of times what we're afraid of is that if I feel it, I'll act upon it. See, with sexual desires, it's very interesting because a lot of times our sexual desires flow through us, but they're based on other things other than sex. The reason why we're often attracted to people has got nothing to do with sex. I think it was in Greece I did a discussion where I talked about the body, the human body, and the chakra points of the human body, right? Seven or whatever it is there is, one, two, three. It depends how, who you are, of course, how many there are, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. Let's say 
we've got a sin, an emotion, that is a sin inside of us that causes the chakra to rotate in a certain area that's opposite to how it should be. And the other person's got the corresponding energy which will feed that emotion, that vortex of sin, if you like. We're naturally attracted to them. And because that opens up the flow of energy in us, we now have a sexual feeling for them as well, right? But is a sexual feeling actually attraction? Or is it just the fact that being around that person opens up a few of the places that you've been closed down and now you feel an attraction? So you don't know, do you? So unless you feel what the attraction is about, how are you ever going to identify whether there's sin in it or not? Uh, so you're saying to feel the emotion so that I can feel what it's about? Yeah, yeah, of course. If you don't feel what it's about, you, what you're doing is suppress, suppress, suppress. Oh, oh, this might be bad, might be wrong. You don't know one way or the other. You assume that it might be wrong, so you're going to suppress it and put it all away. But you know what that does? That just comes back and bites you at some point in the future. So the intention. So I need the intention of feeling why I have the attraction. Yes. And frequently it's because being with that person makes you feel something about yourself that you've never felt before. And that doesn't mean that it's your soulmate. And it doesn't mean even that you're even sexually attracted to them. It just means that it opens up a part of you that you've not had opened up before. And because that part is flowing, now some sexual energy flows in you. Right? And so the sexual energy is almost sometimes a subsequent result of this other issue, which is the real problem, that you need a certain feeling from a person and that particular person gives you that feeling. You follow me? Yeah. So when I first met you, you were w with a person who basically dominated you and you were with them for a reason, right? And that reason made you feel attracted to them. They felt assured. They felt positive. They felt in control of their life to you. They, they weren't. When I look at the guy, you know, when I first met him, I go, he's not very in control of his life. But you felt he was. He made you feel then safe and secure and, and everything. And so you feel a sexual attraction to him. But was it really sexual attraction? Isn't it just attraction opening up the sexual flow in you because of these other things? Can I ask you a couple of questions then? Sure. Are we now talking about sin or are we now talking about your personal life? No, about sexual attraction and about soulmates. Sure. Because a lot of our sins are about sex. They are. Does the feeling of sexual attraction feel the same as that vortex feeling? Well, for most of us it does, yes. But it's not true. It's not how it is when you meet your soulmate, no. But for most of it it does because we don't understand that the sexual flow, for, for any emotion to flow, it's got to flow through the soul, right? The more of our energy points that are blocked, the more blockage there is to the flow of that kind of emotion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, for example, I can be a very angry man and if I'm with a woman who's very timid, right, who's very timid, right, I'm going to feel sexually attracted to her because I know she's going to do whatever, she, whatever I want, right? I'm going to think she's my soulmate. Right. It's not true. The thing that's opening me up is I'm angry and I'm not feeling my anger. And whenever I'm with a timid woman, she'll accept my anger and rage as a part of me and put up with it. And so I feel attracted to her because she's allowing me to have one of my feelings that I would otherwise have to block. Mm. Do you follow? Yeah. Yeah. And so now I think oh, I'm sexually attracted. And this timid woman now feels she's sexually attracted to me too. Because when I'm around this angry man, he sort of, out there and he's like in everyone's face and everything. He's going to protect me, look after me. That's the feeling. It's not very real because the reality is he's just as likely to bop you in the nose, right? But we believe it to be true. He opens up some chakras in her about her worth and her, her safety, safety, third chakra here, you know, worth, second chakra, opens up those kind of chakras. And, of course, they're very closely related to our sexual feelings open those up and I'll get some sexual feelings too, right? And then I go, wow, I'm just horny for the guy, Yeah. right? Is it true? Not really. I'm just horny for the feeling of feeling like someone will look after me and that someone's going to care for me and someone's going to protect me. Okay. Do 
you see? That's completely different than actually wanting, like having a sexual relationship with the person. You're really having a sexual relationship with their injury. With the addiction. Yeah. There's a sexual relationship between your injury and their injury. So we'll be able to feel that. It'll feel like sexual attraction, but if we feel it carefully... We'll be able to tell. If the you're difference. honest, you've got to be honest. You listen to God. See, God can tell you all these things. You say, "Yeah, you know, this guy's a pretty angry man, and you're attracted to him. What's going on? You know, he'll tell you things like that. You know, there's things going on here that, or oh, this guy's a man you can dominate, and that's why you like him. You know, you've had a series of men you couldn't dominate, and then you got sick of them, right? Kicked them off your, out of your life. Then you, what do you want now? You want a man who you can dominate. Ah. Right? You get a man you can dominate. Now you feel attracted to him. And some sexual flow happens because now you can dominate him because you've had these bad experiences before, parts of the injuries. So you feel sexually attracted to him. But is he a soulmate? Probably not, eh? Possibly not. Who knows? You're not going to know until you work your way through the reason why you want to dominate the man, which is the history of the grief associated with the reason why men dominated you. Do you see? And then you go through that and then you realise, I'm not even attracted to this guy. What was I attracted to this guy for? Yeah, okay. A huh? uh, question about the soulmates. So if my, the soulmate part of my soul is not open, can I feel sexually attracted to my soulmate or will it just be addiction? It will just be addiction again. Yep, yep. If the soulmate part of your soul isn't open and you've got all these injuries regarding the opposite gender, even if you meet your soulmate, you probably won't even recognize them. You know what I mean? But if you do recognize them, it will be highly likely because they've got exactly the same injuries that meet those addictions in you. Right? Either way, you've still got to address the issue, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So the way to address the issue is to feel the emotion and work your way through the issue of why am I attracted to this person? You know, you can talk to God. Is this person what I imagine them to be? Or are they really like I'm thinking they are? Because quite often it's quite different. Uh, quite often we want to believe the person we're attracted to has all these qualities. We imbue them with all of these qualities that they don't even have. Because that's meeting our addictions also. Well, because they are meeting our addiction in the sexual way. We now want justification for why we feel this fantastic feeling we feel with them, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we will paint a pretty picture over the top of what's ever there and have the relationship with that. And like I said, most sexual relationships are actually a relationship between two injuries that are not related to sex at all. They're related to other emotions that we need fulfilled in our life that are not fulfilled. And we are using, and they open, they are, you know, they open the flow of emotion in us and so we feel a sexual flow as a part of the opening up of those emotions. But it's not actually, like I said, we're sexually attracted to them feeding my injury, which is not sexual attraction really, is it? No, no. Okay, great. So frequently people who are soulmates have very different sexual injuries and so when they walk past each other in the street they don't even recognise each other because they only are recognising the people or are attracted to the people who meet their sexual injury-based demands. And your sexual injuries are not just related to sex, they're related to how you feel about yourself, how afraid you are, how much grief you have, how much truth you speak. You know, all of the chakra points are all related and the more of them that open with a person at the same time, the more flow of sexual energy there's going to be. Uh, okay, so when, when one chakra starts moving, then the other ones also... Well, they start, the next one gets a bit of a knock on the door then as well, doesn't it? And, and so forth. And usually the people we're attracted to usually have two to four of the chakra points with the flow of specific emotion in harmony with ours. That's all it needs, two to four. And it's funny, when you work through those two to four emotions, you go from feeling like sexually attracted to them, feeling overwhelmed by their presence to feeling like they're a pain in the neck. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, once you close down at all and, you, and they still have 
the emotional demands they have open, you'll then go, I don't, <laughs> this is terrible. I, this is not what I'm looking for. And this is why we've got to be very careful by acting immorally sexually. Every time we act immorally sexually, we're just usually feeding some of these other needy feelings that we have within us, and we're using the sexual relation as an excuse to feed them because sex feels nice occasionally. And so what we're doing is we're feeding them, and then when we work through those issues, we realise, wow, I'm not even sexually attracted to them anymore. So why were you sexually attracted in the first place? It has to be because you're sexually attracted to their injury. Right. And their injuries fed your needs. Yeah. It's codependent emotional barter is really what it is, isn't it? Yeah. And you've had a life of that when we met you, up until we met you. You had a life of codependent emotional barter with angry men most of the time. So you know that that's the life you've lived up until that point. So the key thing now to do is to work through those injuries emotally. Well, this was a totally different kind of... Oh, it's going to be a flip side of that, yeah, eh? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And you can see why. I've already given you the explanation as to yep, why. Yeah, I heard you, yeah. Yeah, because you're sick and tired of those men. Yep. Now you want a different one. Yep, I got one. <laughs> you want one, you can... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite like that, but you know what I mean? Well, I hope I wouldn't do that, but right, I could. But someone but you, could. you can control. Someone who will pander to what you believe your needs are. Yeah, he's very compliant. Yeah, and he does, huh? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's different. So not a good sign. No. No, because all you're doing is you've, in past relationships, you've had a balance of power that's been you here, the man in the power. Now... You have enough of those relationships, what happens? You get angrier and angrier usually, right? And then it becomes like, I'm sick of those men. Now what do you want? Someone I can control, sure. Someone where you're in the power? Yeah. Are either one loving? No. No. So got to let yourself work through that. Yeah. Okay. Good day. Thank you. No worries. Good question, though. Good question. Okay. How are we going time? We're pretty over, eh? 46 to 46. When am I meant to finish? 40. Six minutes we're over. Okay. Can we squeeze one more? Okay, let's. Oh, here's a good one. Shula. Where are you, Shula? Down to the hot seat, my dear sister. So just tick that one. Put the office use. Shuler office use is now ticked. Assuming I get to answer. Okay, good question. Can you explain what you mean by living in fears creates a loving facade, pseudo spirituality, hypocritical behavior, pretense, and guise? How many of you feel like you're a very afraid person? Huh? Okay. How many of you feel that you have good reason to be very afraid person? Huh? So quite a few. Yeah. Fear is an insidious emotion because fear teaches you that you're not angry. Any sense? Now, a person who lives in fears, what they do with it is they create a bubble around themselves which is really saying I'm a really nice person I'm just scared that's why I didn't do the right thing because I'm just scared well that's why I feel angry now because I'm just scared you're making me feel scared stop making me feel scared right so the reality is that a person who says they're afraid is frequently quite angry but doesn't want to own up to the fact that they're angry and they use a facade to protect the truth about their fear, which is they want to stay living in fear, right? And you are a person who does want to stay living in fear. I do, yeah. Yeah. And if you're not careful, you can go, my fear is true. It is justified. It is real. It is something that I should never have to give up, right? 
And that is quite an angry place when you think about it, isn't it? It's like saying, no, I'm going to stubbornly hold on to the fact that I have a right (laughs) to be afraid. I have good reason to be afraid. You should never make me feel afraid. And then we have a tendency, of course, to even get angry with other people who make you, as the saying goes, feel afraid. Or what we do is we wrap it all up in a pretty picture, which is hypocritical behaviour, pretense and guise, isn't it not? It's like portraying yourself to be a nice person when really, as long as anybody doesn't touch your fear, you're a nice enough person. But as soon as somebody touches your fear, you turn from nice person to monster. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And this is frequently the case with people who say they're afraid that you can easily switch from being a nice person to being a not very nice person. And when I say not very nice, it's even not very nice to not stand up for truth. So let's say you're in a situation, you've got the ability to share the truth, your fear is saying to you, don't share it, don't share it, don't share it, you're going to get in trouble, don't share it. Now, let's say it's one of your friends that is getting slandered. This frequently happens with Mary and I, where we're not around the situation and some of you believe yourselves to be my friends, but the reality is when somebody lies about me, you're pretty happy to sit down and just let them lie, right? Why? Because you don't want to stand up and say the truth. Why? Because you say you're afraid. But that makes you not a nice friend. Can you see? It's sort of like, so why you might feel to be kind and considerate and everything in general day-to-day life, the reality is there's no moral fortitude. Fear causes all moral fortitude to disappear. Can you see? So in that situation, if I'm like, if you're afraid of being attacked by the other person for standing up for truth, your value is more of that than... That's right. You are valuing your fear more than you value your friends, more than you value your life, your own life even. Most people don't even value their own life more than they value their fears and particularly value truth and love. You see, this is where we have what I would define as moral inconsistencies. We say we love the truth, but put us in a situation where we've got to stand up for it. What do we do? Say nothing. And then we give ourselves an out. And the out is, I was afraid. That's my out. right? So it's really just a lot of times fear is just an out to not be courageous or an out to not get attacked. A slippery way of avoiding what you believe will be the potential. Now, people surprise me a lot too in this regard because it feels to me like A lot of times you presume standing up is going to be a problem. You don't even know. Like Your faith is such that you believe it's going to be, but you don't know. So what I've learned is that sometimes I've stand up. I I thought I was going to get hammered. I stand up and I don't get hammered at all. So it's to do with the faith then in the fear and the false expectations of what? Correct. You have faith in fear. You believe. If you live in harmony with your fear, it will protect you. I do, yeah. You do, yeah. And what I'm saying to you is God is saying to you, no, Shula, no, your fear is going to attract some pretty negative things, which it already has done, by the way, right, in your life. You know, you married a man who was overtly really, if not abusive, certainly controlling because of your fear, right? And you haven't found that very comfortable, right? But you married him because of your fear. So there's an example where you believed in your fear and yet not a good result. No, no, it's because, you know, I thought he gave me safety. and You thought he gave you safety, but eventually he ran off and found another girl. So he didn't really give you safety, did he? No. No. So at the end of the day... Your belief in your fear is a false belief in your fear, but you're still not not accepting that. You, You want to say, no, my fear is real. My fear is real. I've got to keep avoiding it in my life. I've got to keep doing things to avoid it. And that makes a facade, you see. It automatically creates a guise, a pretense. 
basically it's a way of saying I'm a really nice person because I'm so afraid of everything. I'm just a really nice person. But actually people who are afraid of everything are not nice people. And the reason why they're not nice is because they never stand up for anything that's right. They never do. They always will slip out of it. You know what I mean? So that's not nice. So we've got to stop giving ourselves excuses for fear. Make sense? Yeah. So the attitude to the sin of fear frequently is, I have a right to maintain my fear. My fear is real. My fear is a positive thing in my life. It protects me. All of which are false statements from God's perspective. And God's trying to help you work through your fear. And unfortunately with fear, the law of attraction is such that you're going to have fearful events in order to work through fear. So you attract some fearful events and then you get more rigid, more controlling, more resistive, more protective of your life and withdraw more and more back into your shell. And that's not the way to go. The way is to let go of that fear and have good cries about your fear and risk really process through your fear. Once you get through it, you wonder, what the hell am I afraid of? God's got a lovely, secure universe. For my soul, what am I afraid of? And then you won't honour your fear. So one very big attitude to sin is about protecting fear. That's a very negative attitude to sin. Yeah. Good question, though. Thank you. No worries, Chawler. Okay, well, let's have a break now. And it's lunchtime, so should we come back at half past one? Is that cool? Yep. Good on. Thanks, guys. <laughs>